Today's text is actually one of my favorite scriptures, and that is likely in part due to my calling as a hospice chaplain. I have known, again, Ben and Miranda since our living uh, at the Divinity House together, and while most of my colleagues there came to wonderful churches like Hurstbourne, um, I uh, serve hospice health, or I'm sorry, I serve Bluegrass Care Navigators, Hospice of the Bluegrass in Lexington, Kentucky. Before that, for a couple of years, I worked for Hospice Health, hospice here in Louisville um, in the southwest part of Justin County. As a chaplain, I witnessed to a great many stories. I'm a story keeper, per se. My job includes going to various homes, nursing homes, assisted living homes throughout Fayette and Jesmond counties to visit with hospice patients and their loved ones or their caregivers. Some of my patients I meet one time, some I know for hours, days, other, others weeks, months, years even. But every hospice patient has been given a prognosis or a life expectancy likely of, of six months of life or, or less. And though I am often seeing folks who are, who are somewhat older than I, I see people of all ages, all classes, races, genders, religious affiliations, non-religious affiliations, sports team affiliations, um, sexual orientations, you name it. For hospice patients, the focus of care has shifted from a curative approach to curing their disease to one of comfort and trying to lift up one's quality of life. And so that's why, in addition to the nurses, the doctors with whom I work, there's a chaplain, there are social workers, there are music therapists, there are sometimes therapy dogs, uh, but there are many forms of trying to care for people's uh, spiritual, um, their emotional pain. Now, when I tell friends or new congregations about my job, uh, I get a variety of mix mixed responses. Uh, a lot of people wonder how I'm able to do this work day in and day out. And I won't lie, um, this fact about myself, I don't always love having to disclose it. Uh, it's a bit of a bomb on first dates when you tell people you're a hospice chaplain. Um, sometimes I can feel the energy in a room or a conversation shift a little bit when I let people know what it is I do. And I often reply that I, outside of work, I'm a normal person. I love to bike, and I love antique books, and I love my family, and I love dogs. Um, but one of the reasons I really love my job um, is that it affords me some working insights about people, about life, and about the human condition. And I'm 30, so I have a lot to learn. But today, in light of our scripture reading, I want to offer a few lessons gleaned from my work as a hospice chaplain imparted to me by the patients and the families with whom I journey. Again, I think you'll hear echoes of Moses' words today, and I pray that you hear a bit of your story. So without further ado, here are five working observations about people, again, learned and being learned by a 30-year-old, maybe naive, hospice chaplain. One, human beings are often scared. Every time I see a patient or a family, I have to afterward, when I chart in their, their medical record, I have to note the interventions that I used to try and, and help them spiritually. So perhaps I offered a prayer, perhaps we did hymn singing, um, perhaps I used active listening, but lately I've become, again, joking uh, that one of my interventions should be just cautiously and lovingly uh, asking folks to take one break, just turn off the news for just a little bit. There are folks that I see often who will leave the news on all day as a source of comfort. It's very reasonable, very understandable. And I will hear these patients tell me, what is going on with our country? What is going on with this world? And then this is the really fun one because as a chaplain, I'm mostly apolitical. They will ask me, hey, John, when are we going to get, insert current president here, out of office? Within these comments, I tend to hear grief. I hear fear. I hear a lamentation that 
The world is changing too quickly that as a society we'll make one step forward and we'll make two steps back. Working for Hospice here in Louisville, I learned about all the pressures facing our neighbors in Portland, the West End. I learned about the, the, the lives of blue collar families up and down Dixie Highway. And all of this coincided with the general fear we all felt and still feel during COVID. A lot of people I'm learning are just kind of trying to make it day to day. Hospice patients, even more so. And we all have ticks, we all have struggles as part of our facing the crumminess of, of life. And some of us, some of my patients want to explore those issues and some don't. But we all have something we could work on, whether you want to admit it or not. All right, lesson number two. Despite this, many, if not most people, have deeply profound faith. I recently did a, a funeral for a sweet little 90-year-old German man. And during the funeral planning, his uh, family members repeatedly remarked on the role that faith played in their family's life. And they would echo um, this phrase said by the patient's late wife, who always used to say, you must always have faith. The family explained that faith or, or trust, a sense that God was with them, enabled this patient and his wife to flee Nazi Germany and to relocate to the states where they built their family together. I recall another caregiver where if I wouldn't get through to them, I had the pleasure of listening to their voicemail and her voicemail would say, don't tell God about your problems. You tell your problems about your God. Now what this family lacked in financial security or even a safe place to live, they made up for in faith or trust in their God. And trusting in God's benevolence allowed them to care for their daughter. Most people I think, and most people I talk with, have something that they trust in. For Moses and the Israelites, trusting the Lord looked like observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances. Others, we place our trust in that God and in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Many patients place their faith in the universe, in nature, in their families. God looks different for each of you as it does each person in this world. And I often hear patient families say, I don't know how anyone could get through this journey without faith. And in that, I tend to hear gratitude for a God that helps them keep going. They're a part of something. They are loved. They are held by something. And that thing will be here when their time here ends. Okay, lesson number three. We are interconnected. This will show my age a little bit. I, was once, I once had a patient who was 97 years old. Now his father lived to be 98. His father lived to be 108 years old, meaning that my patient's grandfather, uh, whom he knew and remembered fondly, had been born in 1851. I have known uh, one of Reese Witherspoon's public school librarians I can tell you who created the little triangle peg game that are on the tables at Cracker Barrel. Uh, some of my patients in Louisville included a rock artist who at one time played with the Allman Brothers, at another time played with Donny Osmond, and two descendants of the Hatfield McCoy families uh, who despite the odds and despite their family histories ended up together in a very loving relationship. The past I am learning really isn't that far away, nor are events or histories which we think often have little to do with us. And add to that all the complicated interconnections within every family, within every church. I see siblings who butt heads precisely because they are so connected. I see parents who grieve distances from their children 
despite the emotional connection that you'll never stop sharing with your child or your parent. Our lives touch and affect the lives of so many people, whether we realize it or not. And this is why I believe we should think very clearly about how we choose to live. So lesson number four. We get to choose how we approach this life that we have been given. No patient ever shares a good story about the time they sat around and did nothing and chose to live in numbness or absolute hedonism. No, cha no patient ever shares a good story about the time that they were the absolute center of their own little universe. Literally every single story that I am honored to receive in my getting to know our fellow humans revolves around the choices, good or bad, that my patients make throughout their lives. In imploring us to choose life so that we and our descendants may live, Moses reminds me of all the patients who smile and they grin when sharing how they met their spouses. These patients made a choice at whatever moment in their life to take a gamble, maybe, and ask their honeys out. I'm reminded of all the many patients who chose to pursue their educational, their professional, their vocational dreams over and against adversity so that they might find fulfillment in their callings. I think of all the patients who boast with wonderful pride about the families that they chose to make the children they chose to maybe adopt, the, the dogs that they, and the cats they chose to care for. I recall patients who choose to express their grief, their anger, their frustration, refusing to go gently into the death that awaits them. None of my patients are, are perfect, neither are you or I. We remain Israelites in the desert, growing and being shaped into the beloved community God is crafting of us. But each and every visit, I'm reminded that the promised land, that fulfillment, eternal life, the kingdom of heaven, it awaits us should we choose again and again to participate in this mystery called life. Whether we like it or not, God sets before us life and death. And the world now more than ever can appear so dark and numbing and chaotic. But Moses echoing the words of so many individuals at the end of their lives strips God's teachings down from different instructions to one simple invitation. Life is a mystery that we can choose to accept and dance within and participate. Choosing life doesn't mean sugarcoating or ignoring death but it means accepting that God gives us life and choosing every moment of every day to dance within this mystery. So point number five, we have everything that we need. The word is very near to us. It is in our mouth, it is in our hearts for us to observe. The kingdom of heaven is within us. With God's grace, may we go forward as all of my patients, as all of you, as all of your families, as all of us in the world. May we go forward into this world choosing to live, to participate, to obey, to follow, to smell, to laugh, to cry, to shout, to dance. May we learn to look past our little idols, our distractions, our golden calves, our money, our stuff, all the little things we're called to worship and obey. And may we trust in the living God who takes our fear and encourages us to live fully and deeply, becoming more human and more Christ-like every moment. This, I believe, is what the law, the Torah, points us toward. This is what I believe Christ was all about. Praise God, we have been given the ability to choose what we will do with the time that we are here. May we choose life so that you and your descendants may live, 
loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Amen. <laughs> 